Mm. So, let's do this. Uh, All right. um, well, we represent uh, the uh, four ninths of FESCO, so even we don't have quorum today. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna cancel, right? <laughs> I mean, normally we would cancel the meeting, but uh, let, let's, uh, I don't know, uh, let's try for a bit. Um, so my name is Byszek, uh, I work on Systemd and I have been in FESCO for uh, six years now, I think. Yeah, uh, my name is Neil, I've been in, uh, I do lots of stuff in Fedora and other places and things like that. Uh, and I think I've been in FESCO, I think I first got on FESCO at the start of the pandemic. So I've only lived in pandemic era. Uh, I'm Kevin Finzi, or Neric, and I've been in FESCO since it was the Fedora Extra Steering Committee. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's a name I haven't heard in forever. And I am David Cantrell. I have been on FESCO, I guess, also during the entirety of the pandemic. This is actually the first time uh, we've, we've met in person, uh, so that's, that's kind of interesting to think about. Um, I've been in Fedora for... Uh, I, a long time. I, I, wor I work on software. <laughs> yeah. We do things. We've been around. So, uh, yeah, um, I mean, meet your FESCO the way these normally go is we just uh, kind of open it up to questions and, um, you know, if it, however technical you want to get or non technical, um, we can talk about anything, really. I will check uh, if there are any questions online. I guess that's a probably good idea. Um, so, one thing that I uh, uh, that we we tried um, is uh, moving the discussion of Fedora changes to discourse uh, discussion Fedora Project Org, and um, I think that the results were mixed. Uh, we started with some very tough ones, so we were overloaded by the, the number of um, comments. Um, personally, uh, for me, uh, email is just more comfortable, easier to get around in, uh, and more familiar, more efficient. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we had more comments from people uh, from new people and people from outside of the community or fringes of the community, um, uh, which was, well, challenging in some ways, but also good in, in other ways. So um, I don't think that it's, uh, at least for myself, I cannot say that the, this move was uh, clearly good or clearly bad. I can see, uh, uh, see it both ways. Uh, I hope to, uh, uh, that with other proposals which are less contentious, we will have a smoother workflow and then maybe it will work better. Um, and I don't know, that's, that's, that's how I view it. I, I was wondering how other people see it. Uh, my brain melted during that discussion. Uh, so. I, I, I can add to it if you want. Take a yeah. Uh, well, no. I, I have uh, I have some thoughts on it. Like the the I'm always in favor of uh, of making it easier for people to to provide constructive and valuable feedback and and input into the thing that they're using and building upon and 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 in being invested in right. Like being uh, enabling more participation is always great. The flip side of it, though, has been um, the this particular the, this particular discussion uh, wound up feeding itself into a a very de uh, destructive frenzy. Is I think the 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 um, easiest way I could describe it, and it got amplified and reamplified and fed on itself and. Uh, because the it's a it's the trade-off of you know how far you want to go and what you know how much 
how much you want to have input from. And I don't know if we figured out a good balance for this with putting it into discussion FPO. Um, I, my, my personal opinion about this is I have some reservations about continuing to do this, but I'm also willing to see how some of the others go before making a, um, a full judgment on it. I mean, I'm, I'm glad we're trying the experiment and seeing how that's gonna work out and seeing what kind of participatory effects and what kind of quality of discussion we get. It gives us a good idea of whether this is something we want to, to continue down or not. But, you know, I guess we'll see. Yeah, my, my observation has been that, uh, you know, we, we wanted a way to get more input on change proposals. That's the core item that we work by on FESCO. Um, you've probably seen them before. Uh, th there's a process, we discuss it, we vote on it. That's how changes get into Fedora. On the mailing list side, which I will say I'm more comfortable with that only because I've been doing this for a long time, um, <clears throat> the mailing list side, it felt like, or at least over the past couple of years, change proposals would only get comments by roughly the same five to ten people. I don't know if that's because they were not as visible or that they, people just felt like they were not, you know, welcome to comment on it or it was kind of a thing they couldn't participate in. So expanding that, getting that outreach uh, through discourse has been good because at least it makes our discussion on FESCO easier because we have input from more of the community. You know, what do people actually want to do? Is this something that people want? Uh, so just having more data points is useful, but I see the, the, the discourse side as having an opposite effect. So the people that were comfortable on, on the mailing list are now uncomfortable on discourse. So we, we can pick one set of, of people we want to hear from or, or the other, and, and we can't get both. But the answer isn't to post it in both places. We, we need to come up with a better solution. I do think that when we, we tried uh, the discourse mes method, we did not really do a good job of explaining what the change proposal process is to people who had largely ignored it. So I, I observed a lot of uh, community members thinking that the, these were more of announcements of decisions that had been made as opposed to discussions of changes. So I think we could have done better at explaining what this was going to be and what we expected everyone to do. Uh, so that was, I think, kind of new for everyone. I don't, I don't know if you guys like noticed yeah, that Yeah, there well. was definitely yeah. like, a lot of people said, you know, this is a foregone conclusion. And, then, and I think there's, there's a couple of, of, of reasons for that that at least I observed. It's like one of them was, um, our, the way that, that changes have landed in Fedora over the last like, you know, decade uh, that I've been observing this has largely been uncontroversial, super easy. They go through, there's the, fee the feedback is discussed and things are resolved before they get to us. So it starts looking like whenever they get to the FESCO level that they're quote unquote rubber stamp. But the reason that they get to the point when they reach us that we're all comfortable with this because we're also participating in these discussions and people are resolving our concerns way before we get to that first meeting. And so people have this um, uh, conception of we rubber stamp things when we actually don't. Um, and then on top of that, the way that the news reports on Fedora's changes process, like so if you look at some of the Pharaonics and others, um, there is a very, very, important reason, a very big reason why we now have this banner that says this is a proposal in the wiki pages is because there was a number of incidents where volatile changes were being proposed that people assumed were going to just happen. Some of them didn't actually happen, but they didn't know that and they reported on it and misreported it. and then there's this like view that a change proposal isn't in fact a proposal but like the equivalent of like what a, um, a proprietary vendor does that says, hey, we've done this thing, you're, you gotta just deal with it, right? Like that's, that's the, uh, I think that's a, the two big parts of it. Yeah, I think there's some, some really good lessons learned from this, this, this discussion that we had on that uh, controversial change. 
And I think that's one of the big outtakes from it is that people don't understand the process and we need some way to tell them this is a proposal, you're supposed to give feedback, it's not done yet, it's still under process. Uh, also, I think there's a lot of associated things around that, like people didn't realize, a lot of people thought with this particular proposal, oh, it's a team in Red Hat. So Red Hat proposes things and then people just approve them. Well, no, anybody can propose something. If you have something that you want to do and you're willing to do the work and you're willing to write it up and uh, get it through the process, that's fine. Anyone can do it. Um, but I, I think a lot of people didn't know the process and perhaps were pointed at the discussion from uh, a context like, oh, here, you should say no to this. And they just would go and say no and not actually read through the, uh, the proposal. So I think there's lessons learned from it. I think I'm also on the mixed case. I think we got a lot more input from people on the outside in the community and that's great. I think expectations were bad. We learned some lessons. Hopefully those will feed into this and make it actually better. I think it's still worth doing. I think it's a good experiment and we don't have enough data points really yet. This is kind of a uh, a crazy outlier. This, this I game. hope it's a crazy outlier. Yes. I don't want I don't want discussions to be like this all the time. Well, how how do we think the nano default editor proposal would have gone on discourse? I, so I think it would have actually gone the opposite of the mailing list. You, you bring that up, and and in all seriousness, I think if we had let let in 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 theory crafting land that we had the nano discussion on discourse rather than on the mailing list, it would have been completely the opposite way because the people that are on discourse are the complete different set of people than what we've been interacting with on the mailing list. A lot of them are either newbies or first timers or they're thin skin, thin, they're first into Linux and, and they're, their points of accessibility into the terminal and all this other stuff, they would have appreciated the change more than a lot of the people that have been old school have been battered by the, you know, the old Unixes and whatevers and they've, they've lived by the scars of their Eds and Vis. And so I think it would have actually gone the other way. It would have been contentious for a different reason. Because you'd have some of those old timers complaining that we just did something for, you know, well, I think we've actually had some of those complaints during the thing about like, we're, we're um, simplifying or, or making it like, we're not making it less as Yes, we were making it too easy. And stuff like that. Oh yeah, that definitely comes up too often as people, people think because it was hard for them, we should keep it hard for everyone. Like difficult I, I want learn. everything to be easier than what I had. It. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we want to do. But. So, wait, wait. It's <laughs> a good point. Comments from the audience, please. <laughs> no. So we robbed people of the uh, learning experience of how to get out of Vim. Oh. <laughs> that I mean, that's a good point, and you know, people people brought that up, and you know, I. It, it's kind of funny all the points that came up specifically on the, the nano change proposal, and I don't use nano. Um, I, I used Vim for like. 25 years and, and then changed to, to Emacs and actually became way more productive. But that doesn't matter. I mean, the editor is everyone's choice, right? Um, and, and you didn't just slip that in just because. Right, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think I, I, in one conversation I brought up like, you know, guys like Gentoo, which is, you know, if you really just have a lot of time to burn and you want to set up a Linux system, you can. But their default editor, I think, was, was Nano, actually. Yeah, it still yeah. is. So, you know, it's, it's viewed as kind of a high tech, you know, uh, end user sysadmin distro and it's using nano so you know whatever and, and another counter another counterpoint to this particular like you want to keep it hard so everybody learns the hard stuff is like I have skills for how to f screw around with DOS systems like I started with MS DOS and I used DOS editor I screwed around with config.sys and autoexec.bat how many of y'all ever have to touch one of those these days I, I, I promise you almost none of you do the unless you're like doing retro stuff uh, for the fun of it like I do sometimes so like those kind like you don't need to keep things to be hard to keep it fun and to keep people learning. You give them new interesting things to learn and grow from. And there's new hard things for them to also. Oh yeah, <laughs> the hard yes, things don't true. ever completely go away. They just change. behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this thing is like nice to hear, but uh, is, 
I actually don't mind about either of them, nano, whatever. <laughs> but I would love to hear uh, your uh, insight into recent decision about DNF5. So oh. that's the controversy. <laughs> so I'll put it on the stage, and I'm especially okay. curious. Uh, like, yeah, it happened to revert, uh, but why it was reverted in, in rawhide, especially? Why not to foster in, in rawhide and continue uh, testing development there? Yeah, so uh, I think, at, I, I said this multiple times, I, I think that I'm, I'm very proud of the DNF team for like looking at this and deciding that it wasn't ready. You know, most of the time people who invest so much time and energy and work into something and there's a deadline and they're not quite meeting the deadline, they'll try and get it in anyway. But I, I think they did a, a really smart thing and a really, uh, a really good thing to decide to pull back from there. And I think the, the question as to whether leaving it on in Rawhide to get more testing, I mean, it's still there. People can use it. It's just not going to be default. But we don't want Rawhide to be used as a, just a test bed where it's not actually intended to go into the next release. We want it to be an integration point where people are actually testing the thing that will you know, go to the next release. So I, I think it's, it's good to revert it there until it's ready to, to actually go in. Um, I don't know how much more, really much more testing would go on there. But it's hard to say, but there, a lot of the stuff like the API wasn't stable until fairly recently as well. And so there's going to be a lot of stuff that's porting over to it, but it still could be tested. It's just not default. So. Yeah. I Oh yeah, I, I'll add that the, the DNF team is the team that I work on as well. Um, and you know, it was, I guess it was um, disappointing, but really the, the correct decision. Um, it, just the feedback in general on uh, DNF5 and the current state leading up to Fedora 39, um, there, there was too much that was unfinished, in my opinion. I. I DNF is, is one of those components in Fedora that we absolutely need to work. And since we already have one that, that is implemented, to move to one that, that loses core functionality that we have documented, that we tell users they can rely on, um, just, it, it, it just felt incomplete. So it, it, it needs a little more runway uh, to, to sort of complete that. Um, and just this morning I was talking about uh, test days, uh, implementing more DNF5 test days. We, I think we came up with three that we need to do. Um, but the FESCO ticket, uh, where we were talking about implementing the contingency plan to revert it, uh, there, there were a lot of things that were pointed out there. And to me, I feel like that was a kind of a rare situation for us to get that much feedback, which, which to me shows that people were trying it. But a lot of stuff just didn't work yet, and, and it just, I, you know, I, like, like um, Kevin said, the, uh, the DNF team just saying, like, yeah, it's not ready. We should, we should pull it back. And, and even still, not just bouncing into the next release, which is another common thing, too. Like, we, we need to rethink our approach here, and, and maybe it won't be ready for, for two releases. Yeah, and as someone who's, you know, I, I have a connection with the DNF team as well because I've been a, a community contributor for almost eight years now in, in the various, you know, RPM systems, uh, software management group uh, projects, the, the, the DNF5 work, you know, when we started, when it started getting rolled out and people started using it, like, it was very, very clear that the, the use case prioritization, there was a mismatch between what Fedora needed and what the community needed and what the team thought they needed. To, to be able to make it happen. And we were encountering pain points and issues and the community was bringing them actually fairly promptly. Um, and that was, that was also unusual. Usually we don't get anything for uh, until like the last minute and things were just, you know, and they were being very, very responsive in addressing the concerns and working through them. But it's just when you get a huge pile of them and there, there's just only so much work you can do at once, and you've got to qualify all that and you've got to make it work. And, and like David said, it's the core of our system. We have to make sure that it's actually solid to the point of like not breaking it. Like the, one of the reasons we went from YUM to DNF was to massively increase the reliability of doing the core thing that we need the distribution to do, which is manage software. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to screw that up in this transition. 
And so I'm really happy that we're taking a step back to take that next step forward. Justin, go. If, if you remember during the, the yum to DNF switch, you know, that was actually rolled out, it, not, not, it wasn't the same state that DNF5 is, but it was a rolled out a little prematurely as well, and there was core functionality of YUM that was now missing from DNF, and that caused a lot of problems. Now, we got over them, it was fixed, and you know, DNF is great now, but we don't want to repeat those mistakes. You know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, that, uh, I was on the Anaconda team at that, that change point, and one thing I remember is during that switch over, we would we would have a bug report for Yum. We would file a bug report. That team would would fix it, but fix it in DNF and and not Yum. So it was like we were starting to have the two drift apart, and we just had, eventually had to make that cutover. And yeah, we got we got past that, but it was it was bumpy. It was it, you know they wanted to say like, look, the the time for DNF is now. Uh, it is fundamentally different. Um, I remember one of the 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 big difficult things with YUM and DNF at that time was uh, installation. If you had YUM as the back end in Anaconda, you would get a different resolved set of packages to install versus DNF, because there were different depth solvers. Um, and that it's like, well, <laughs> okay, uh, I guess we're just gonna have that now, maybe? Um, and yeah, so that's long since passed, but it's, it is important to remember that so that we don't end up in the same kind of situation. Uh, one that I, I um, was disappointed that is not fully implemented yet is the system upgrade capability that we rely on now in DNF that's not in DNF 5. And I was just like, well, I mean, I use that. You know, that's <laughs> like, like, that's gotta be there, you know. So little things like that, you know, we, we definitely need to get. My, my question is, so do, with, with reverting this stuff, like do we have somewhere the list of things slash issues which needs to be solved, and not just in DNF, but with the integration with other tools, like Fedora Review, uh, Discover, other, other stuff, like which needs to be solved, uh, when Mark is done, that's, that's my project. <laughs> that's, that's so, uh, <laughs> uh, which needs to be done so, so we track it and not surprised one year later again, yes. uh, because I asked Jarek ja uh, Mraček, uh, what's the status of the other plugins as well, not just the copper plugin, I said, oh, it's tracked somewhere inside our uh, GitHub, like, but it's not visible outside for the people who are not willing to dive into the bunch of uh, issues, etc. We, we have, uh, yes, we have that information. It's incomplete right now because it's mostly from the first DNF 5 test day that we did, but it does have a lot of those results. What, what did not work? What were we expecting? Bug reports were filed. They've been prioritized, in, in my view, they've been prioritized differently than what Fedora was expecting. So we're at a point now where we, since we've reverted this in, in Rawhide, we need to go back as the DNF team and look at all this and say, okay, the, the, this is how we need to prioritize this work. And yeah, so that information exists, it, it's coming together, so. <laughs> there was some additional information on that in the FESCO ticket too, people were saying, these things are blockers, and then, you know, some of them weren't. Some of them were, or this is implemented, or it's different, or whatever. But some of them definitely were, like system upgrade is not there, and, you know, things like that. Well, and you mentioned Fedora Review, but also all the integration with uh, Fedora infrastructure stuff. C CI yeah. also yeah. is yeah. a big one. Like, and, like, uh, I did a lot of the um, early porting work for moving from Yum to DNF for, all the, for a lot of the Relenge scripts and things like that, and... I literally couldn't start figuring out how to port things from DNF 4 to 5 until like two weeks, two or three weeks ago. And that's really not enough lead time to be able to make yeah. sure everything works. And the API wasn't stable until recently, so. Right, and it's not like I wasn't aware that they were working on it and thinking about it, but like going through the effort of, of making all these changes, especially as a volunteer and spending that time and, and not having documentation and not having uh, understanding of the expectations with the API interfaces and stuff, like that's, it's a real chore to go through all that stuff and like I'm not gonna ask any volunteer uh, to, to do all that work when they don't know what they're supposed to know. And 
you know, once we, like that's, that piece of information is something we, we kind of have started to get and I'm kind of, and I'm hoping that that gets fleshed out more in the intervening months so that we can actually start, you know, giving that feedback from the API side because I know that the test days have given a lot of user feedback but we haven't done a whole lot of producer feedback which is also important for being able to switch over to it because I don't want to repeat of where it took us five years before we could start using rich dependencies because nobody could figure out how to port like the Bodhi and other stuff to use DNF instead. Like that was, I want us to be able to move like that properly to everything. But that was still good because that, before that we had like what 10 years of speaking about it. So, so I'm pretty <laughs> proud that it actually happened. <laughs> yeah, but that was also like the most painful porting projects. <laughs> So um, when the DNF5 discussion in FESCO started, we made an effort to, uh, well, we tried to build a list of requirements. Uh, and this list was, I mean, there was some list created, was very incomplete. Uh, and I think it's kind of the same uh, problem that appears in this kind of switches and, uh, I think it's, I mean, one lesson for me would be that we need to build this kind of list and uh, building of this list is, of such a list is hard because you need good insight into uh, not just the, the thing that is changing but all the surrounding tools and processes and that's hard. Um, and I think it's particularly hard in the case of, of, uh, of YAM or DNF because there's just so many, so many points which need to be touched and um, so many of the external tools are like, uh, well, dead or semi-dead. Somebody wrote them five years ago and they, they live in, in Lang scripts or, or somewhere else. And as long as they work, nobody will start them again. So nobody knows. Um, and there's no clear, I mean, like, I don't know, we have Fedora review and um, obsolution scripts and this and that. And I mean, half of those things have no clear owner, no ongoing maintenance, and uh, nobody will think to, about fixing them until we switch, and then we realize that they're not working. Uh, so if we could do this again, we should probably try to figure out how to, how to find about those things earlier. I, I, I want to add to that. Yes, I, I agree, but on the general topic of requirements, this comes up from time to time. And FESCO, to, to me, FESCO should not be the body that is dictating hard requirements for projects like that. I mean, really, when it comes down to, to DNF, like we, we defer to the change proposal owners, the, the, the engineers who are working on that, but generally speaking, our job is to, to vet these changes and say, okay, well, the requirement from our point of view is don't break things for users. You know, like, so have you done that? We need, we need information to determine if you've, you've really set things up that way. And I think in this case, the DNF case, um, they, they needed, there, there was such a broad impact that, that, that that team needed help to, to really understand who all needed to be a requirement. So in that respect, it was a little unusual. Um, but, you know, really changes are changes and, you know, that might mean that requirements change for software. So we shouldn't say, you know, in a change proposal, this team wants to do something. We, we shouldn't go in and say, well, no, don't change that because we like the old way. You know, I, I, I mean, that's just not really what we're supposed to do. And another thing that actually that change proposals really do and I think do well is I agree with you that the team needs to kind of figure out what they're doing and propose something. But like in this case, uh, DNF is so pervasive across the entire project that they probably very likely do not know all the things. So once the change proposal is out there, people can come and say, well, you know, my thing uses this and have you talked to me? Well, we didn't even know you were using it. So I think that the visibility has helped a lot there. And this is where I say, this is the change process working as designed. <laughs> because if you think about what a change is actually, a proposal is about, it's a description of an implementation of something that is going to affect the distribution and the community, right? So the community responds to that, provides feedback in kind, and we as FESCO collate that feedback and turn it into something 
yeah, in bite-sized chunks that they can that they can turn around and and provide something actionable. Like we go through and we understand, and like when it goes to a meeting, we say, like these are the things that the community highlighted to us that are important. You know, please can you can you find some way to address these so uh, for making this acceptable? And that's essentially what our job is, at least the way that's how I view yeah. it. And we're doing, and, and the DNF changes, and actually both changes we've talked about today are excellent um, examples of how we arbitrate those changes and make sure that you know, we try to have the community's best interests at heart when, we're, when we try to make, when we implement things in Fedora Linux. I have comment and I concur with you and disagree with David. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I, how that yeah, works. Okay. Uh, I don't think FESCO is just about vetting stuff, but like uh, Foster and then a lot of people think that FESCO has executive power and we uh, know that you have no executive power. You can't I would do love, anything. I would love to know where this executive but, but, power but, comes from. Uh, yeah, but I think you have a huge power, and that's the poking stuff. And, actually, and we actually seen that when Zbyshek uh, started, like, what's the status of DNF5? And that was the moment when this starts happening to move. And that was just just the poking. So, so like, poking about the, the other stuff, like, pushing... Like, like, Our job is cat herders. So I think I actually, we don't even have uh, poking power. We have mostly stopping power, right? Yeah, Fesco, yeah, unfortunately, right. can say no, but uh, it's very hard to force any kind of action. Uh, maybe as individual members, we can poke stuff, but as, as a body, we can only say not this cycle. Uh, the, the, yeah, yeah, but, but, but they could also just ignore us and do it anyway. Yeah, they, they can ignore you, but, 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 uh, we mentioned here, like, yeah, we are waiting till the DNF5 will become default and then the semi dead projects will only fix the stuff. And I think uh, it can be a uh, benefit of your body group to, uh, like, poke before. Like, yeah, it's going sure. to happen. Please poke, poke, like, change it, change it, please. If, yeah. you, if you can, if they if they will ignore, yeah, that's that's the life, and it can change from semi dead to dead project, and uh, well, that's I, the life. I, I actually I, I think that's where change proposals can be proposed with like more structure around them, like like have have deadlines within it, like you know we we intend to land this change initially, give us some data points that we can do that poking by, but I mean really I. I Stopping power is kind of the, the only thing we have. And that, that's why we have the contingency plan requirement. And too many change proposals, you know, will come in and say not applicable, you know, uh, self-contained change or something. And it's like, well, maybe that's true, but we still need a contingency plan. You know, we, we need the ability to back this out. What do we do when everything breaks, you know, basically? Yeah, like I've seen a few change proposals that had been before they even reached the mailing list, like where, um, you know, Ben, when he was, you know, doing the thing, it was like, yeah, he would kick back ones that like had the section completely empty. You would be surprised how many of them don't have one at all before they get to the point that they get posted. <laughs> you know, that's actually, uh, we, we, maybe at another event, we should do a presentation or a, a workshop hackfest kind of thing on how to write a good change proposal. Yeah, certainly um, I've written I, more. We've I, all I, written some. Yeah, and I, I, I help people when, when they have questions on how to put it together and uh, it's it appears trivial but um, it you know there's there's key information you need to think about and put in there. Uh, although the hardest part of it is actually doing the work. <laughs> Well, depending on the change proposal, but yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But see, you can you can write the change proposal and then have someone else do the work. That's great if you can get it to happen. <laughs> I mean, one change proposal was literally one change proposal I did was literally in, including one extra package into a comps group, so it was a one-line change. Mm -hmm. But the change proposal document itself was like I think six, seven, eight pages long, and it's just. Yeah, so that also reminds me of, um, it was one that I think was a, a banded some years ago that was proposing, um, there, there were some 
uh, spec file macros, uh, the really complicated sort of oh I, the forge macros. It, no, not, it, the, not it, it was it was something related to that, but yeah. it was just the change proposal was just so long and so detailed. But whoever wrote it sort of abandoned it. Yeah, and and I I don't. I'm glad that happened because if we had to discuss it and vote on it, we would have had like a, a crazy long meeting one day and, and then never voted. But. Yeah, actually, if you look at the wiki for uh, change page incomplete, which is the initial status, there's a whole bunch of interesting things out there. You know, you look at a proposal and you're like, huh, that's actually kind of interesting. But it was somebody who started doing it and, you know, for whatever reason, didn't have the time to complete it or, or whatever. Uh, and that's actually interesting to look through, back through the history there. And sometimes, could have been. So, right, and sometimes you look at one of those things and you're like, wow, that's a really good idea. Let's see if we can revive that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one, a couple of the changes I did were actually me reading through the old features list. When they remember when they were all called features way back yeah. in the day. There's some old abandoned ones there, and it's like, oh, this this is interesting. Let's see if we can like pick it back up now that things have changed enough to make it better. Like it's also if you if you're thinking of doing something cool or interesting or you have you want to do something cool and interesting and you don't know what you might want to do, you could go look at the old graveyard of changes and and see if there's something that catches your eye and maybe you want to spruce it up and try it. Uh, just I, I'm going to ask, please don't revive the Fedora K Free BSD. No, um, don't do that. Idea that <laughs> that came up at some point. I don't know if it still exists on the wiki, but uh, yeah, someone. Yeah. There was a joke proposal several years ago. We hope it was a joke proposal. <laughs> I hope it's a joke proposal <laughs> to 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 add the K free BSD and then like add the <laughs> resulting infrastructure to be able to dual test everything right. on Linux and BSD. Yeah. It's like no. <laughs> Somebody did that. Somebody actually did do that as a derivative distribution. I don't ever want to see it again. Uh, Justin. Yeah. Wait, wait, I, I, I can't hear you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, man. I, I was, I'll start building that kernel in Cobra. We can, we can get started now. Yeah, oh, and, and if you do that, can you also uh, build the Darwin kernel too? Because Oh yeah, I, I know there's might... a lot of people that would love Fedora to have Darwin. Darwin. Yeah. <laughs> Fedora Darwin. I, I don't like having hardware working, so you know, that seems like an ideal kernel. I, actually, IBM did some experimental kernels too we should maybe throw in. I believe they use Linux drivers to make it easier, like the K13 kernel and things like that. We oh, should... that's perfect, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then, yeah, then we're good to go. Let's go. Yeah, so joke or not, we need it on the recording and also nothing ever gets deleted from the wiki so I'm sure it's still there. <laughs> yes. uh, so we, we had a question in the chat. What all things Fesco is thinking to do uh, to explain how change proposals work and how Fesco works to the larger crowd? Um, and we have been touching on this uh, in some aspects but maybe... Uh, uh, so so um, uh, there were a few things that actually that Matthew came up with that I think are, are pretty good, especially for the discussion side. Uh, there's actually a video out there that describes the change process and being, having a link to that for people who like video explanations of things, you know, right there in the top. Also some more explanatory stuff, you know, in the change proposal itself, like maybe going to the process or, or a short summary of what the process is or, or something like that, I think could help. Um, but yeah, it's it's difficult to, to provide that context with somebody who's just coming in new to the project and doesn't know what's going on. And we've added the disclaimer and stuff like that to the top, but it's, it's difficult to convey like the whole process. Uh, but yeah. Do we have a section in uh, the documentation about the like writing a change proposal? Yes, I, know we do. I think so, yes. Okay. Yeah, we do. We could probably expand on that, maybe do some blog posts to just raise awareness as well. Um, I think it's a topic that we should probably be continually revisiting just because people come and go. Like it's one thing to do a one-off, you know, and, and that's good, but the audience changes. So yeah, the video uh, is a good idea and, you know, just increasing the marketing and communication, mm -hmm. the, hard, the hard things to do. The other thing that's really interesting, and I, I thought of this earlier and, and then it kind of faded from my mind, and now we're talking about this again, so it came back, is the way people talk about it as if there's a Fedora team that does stuff. I would love what, to know what this Fedora team is because I've never seen them. Aren't we all a team here? <laughs> I guess, I don't know. <laughs> but like, but the, it's really important to, that the really important thing to convey is that 
A change proposal can be done by anyone who is involved in, f in the Fedora project at all, right? And there's no like team of people that can make them and do the things and whatever. It's just any member of the community who is interested enough to drive an improvement to the project. I mean, we've, we've seen the changes process be abused for things other than the actually changing things in the distribution. So clearly it, it has gone a little bit further than that. But um, like it's intended for technical changes, but we've used it for project changes. We've used it for culture changes. We've used it for a lot of things. Anybody who's interested in driving change in the project, it is the method that the whole community is able to synchronize on and understand what's going on and, and get consensus on. So, so I, I think it's one of those things that uh, it's hard to do from the inside because we have been living this process for so long that we don't see how it looks for um, people from the outside and maybe some newcomer should take on this um, uh, job and, and figure out how to explain it to people who haven't been uh, familiar with it for a long time. Wow, we all actually stopped talking. That happens every once in a while. <laughs> Any, anyone have questions? More? Any in the chat? Nope. How are we doing on time? We can. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so some fling. So, if you would have executive power, oh no, what do you would change in Fedora? Whoa. Uh, uh. So I have I have one thing that I was uh, I was recently looking at uh, fail to build uh, tickets in my packages and other packages, uh, and I there were a few. There were like there was a package that was preventing. 50 other packages from building and I start looking at it and I see oh actually somebody filed a pull request to fix this package a year ago and it's been hanging there in uh, in uh, this git ever since and I don't know if we could have a, a way to to just have uh, pull requests auto apply after a week if nobody uh, protests then that I would, would like to old. see that happen <laughs> Are you sure you want that? Because like that's a be careful what you ask, what you wish for kind of kind of a, 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 a of a wish. And also, I mean, it's so so we we have the packager dashboard which makes it easy to see all the pull requests, but uh, it's also. Apparently, very, very easy to to miss pull requests. If, if you, I mean, you, you get a notification, but I also get a, maybe a hundred other notifications every day. So, if it flies by, then it's easy to miss, and maybe there there should be some mechanism to to escalate this. You know, that's one thing. I I have one. Like it's it's on a lighter note. Uh, if 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 we had executive power. Um, I would like to bring back the Fedora release naming. And yes. The, the, re okay. the reason I yes. say that is that, um, the, and, and I'm not saying it has to be implemented the same way, but what I liked about that is it was a participation point for everyone in the community, regardless of their level of contribution or their technical skill. Everyone could vote on a name. And then we had, like, each time we made a release, it felt like we were this community around that release and we would have that branding. Now, we did make it extremely difficult, the process and stuff like that. Sure, I get that. Maybe we could fix it. But I liked the, I liked the release naming thing that, that, that we would do. It's always in the back of my mind is that I wish we kept the code name stuff because... Uh, it, it, was a, it was a fun point, like one of the earliest entry points for me was, you know, helping pick the name for, I think it was one of the names that was on the voting roll for Fedora, Fedora 12. It was a long, long time ago. And like, I, I think that that is like literally one of the easiest entry points that someone could have to have 
uh, some ownership of what we what we make as a project. Yeah, exactly. Like people, you know, you, if you've just joined, we're we're about to do a release. You know, and you get to vote on this name, and you you see it written up in articles and online and stuff. And you're like, oh, hey, I, I had a hand in that, and it it's just, it was just a ongoing entry point for anyone to to really join. Um, Maybe we should bring it back for that alone. Yeah, you know. Uh, wouldn't that be easier if we did discourse, where you can vote just with plus one and not in I, I don't think it was the voting that was the It was the, the difficulty. names that were on the roll. The, the problem was, uh, of course, as it often gets down to lawyers, so. Yeah, um, it, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Spot can uh, share some, some backstory with that, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't look like you, you really want to right now, but. <laughs> oh yeah, so so maybe I don't know. Maybe we yeah. can get out of that business now. Um, but I, I mean, just just from a community participation standpoint, I think it was really useful. Um, that said, uh, of of the release names that we did have, uh, what do you guys think was the the best name? Oh, ever. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Zod. Schrodinger's was cat was. Yeah, Schrodinger's cat is mine as well. I mean, we also tested the UTF support in the distribution. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Yeah. <laughs> Although Werewolf was a close second because of the, all the kinds of combinatorial, like the community artwork around it was yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. That's true. I, I, I do like the Schrodinger's Cat one because it did create the release blocker. So, so On an the, apostrophe. Yeah, so the, the act of participating and choosing the name actually led to an a, a actual technical bug find, you know, which was, which was neat. Um, and, well, I sometimes have the feeling that it's uh, too hard to do things in Fedora, like that there are things that should happen, and in general people agree that they should happen, uh, but they don't happen because, uh, well, stuff is slow. And uh, so, so I, I mean, I, I, there's many places where I think we should, uh, as a community, Keep in mind that um, just delaying things indefinitely is not a good um, outcome. And so, so if I had executive power, I would just use this power to generally make, make things happen, uh, if possible. Yeah. I'm going to go with that be careful, be careful what you wish for for that one again, because <laughs> that can go very, very badly. I have another one on, on, on uh, executive power. I'm going to assume that we have an infinite budget. Oh, uh, yes. If you, okay, infinite so, budget. Let's go with infinite budget on the condition. So I would like to hold a flock and fund everyone in Fedora to come to it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, regardless of distance and all that stuff. So that, I, with the infinite budget. Now with the leftover money, what would you guys do? Uh, with the leftover money of an infinite budget. Uh, uh, Next generation Koji with being able to do reverse depth tracking and all rebuilding, because then, then I don't need to hear of proven, uh, proven packager requests simply because they were the unfortunate <laughs> souls of a library that they can't actually upgrade anymore because they can't fix everything. I would like that kind of grunt work to just go away. Yeah, I, I, w I was going to say, I could spend an infinite budget on infrastructure. There are so many things, if I could hire 500 people to redo this thing in a sane way and fix the tooling, make make things so easy for packagers. Uh, it would it would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> what do you see as the future of Diskit in light of things like Pagger's uh, current maintenance status and people moving things to GitLab and things like Packet leading more people to not really treat Diskit as the canonical source for spec files anymore. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll, <laughs> we'll get, leave, leave time for everyone else. Yes. All right. Yes. I, will, I, will keep, I will keep my statements on this short, <laughs> I promise. Having, uh, pulling away from the canonicity of Diskit is a recipe for disaster. I have been in distributions where, so some of you may or may not be aware that I actually am involved in much more than Fedora. Uh, uh, over the years, I've been involved in over a dozen different Linux distributions who have done a variety of different ways of shipping software. Uh, one of them, you know, from a lot of those experiences, uh, one of the things I personally feel is a colossal mistake is orphaning your agency of 
the method in which you ship software. And so one of the things that we have to be really careful about with stuff like packet and what we are calling source git, others call merge source trees or, or git package trees or whatever you want to call it, right, um, is we cannot orphan our agency of, of what we ship because we are still ultimately responsible for it. The distribution git or disk git is our packaging git repos that maintain our agency for that. The canonicity of that hosting it inside central Fedora infrastructure is how we preserve the integrity of our systems. Um, projects like Debian, which do not have that requirement, have to work around that problem by doing things like their reproducible builds efforts, which uh, give say that for packages that are going into Debian, we need to try to find a way that you can do a reproduction of it from the output artifacts to recreate the output, ar in, from the inputs produced by the output artifacts to create the same outputs again. We have much more sophisticated ways of being able to verify builds than they do because of these other guarantees that we have. That, to be frank, we don't talk about. We don't talk about like why we've made a lot of those early decisions and what, what benefits they offer. Um, the Packer versus whatever thing. The maintenance status of Packer is in flux because we've got new contributors coming in who are actively working on the project. Earlier, uh, like late last year, as one of the, uh, I was able to, with the Fedora infrastructure folks, finally get the CI infrastructure working again, which means I can start accepting contributions. And that has led to uh, a slow revitalization of the project in a way that we're actually heading towards a new major version where we're doing a lot, right now we're doing a lot of cleanup, killing out a lot of cruft code. There was a lot of weird experiments that we've done that are not needed. So we'll see how that goes. We have three minutes left, or two, no, two minutes left, no, so give, quickly. Give him time to talk, come on, he had, he had stuff. Well, uh, I will be actually very brief also. Um, I think we need to have another discussion about this. I know people maybe don't want to hear that. Oh no, another discussion. But I think things have changed, and I think this shouldn't be a top-down dictate. You know, we shouldn't say, oh, we're moving to GitLab. You know, that's, that's what we're doing. It should be, all right, here's our options. We could stay with Peg Error, we could revitalize it, we could use it, we could go to something like Fostodon or Gidea or you know those sort of products now that are, that are out there and have the possibility of federated uh, repos. Uh, we could um, we could do GitLab. Uh, we could do GitLab in different ways. We could run our own GitLab. We could let them run a GitLab for us, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are a choice that our community should, you know, have in front of it and look at all the facts and figure out. And maybe it goes to a decision from Fesco uh, or something like that. Or maybe it, it, there's constraints around, you know, costs or whatever that, that weigh into it also. But I think we probably need to have that discussion again. I don't think that, it, you know, we're going to get lab is a, a, a conclusion from several years ago that we should stick with. So that's my take. Yeah, I, I just want to add one, one thing because you mentioned packet as well as where diskit lives. So I, I separate sort of thinking about the workflow of package maintenance and, and where source lives and, and that sort of stuff versus the, the system you choose to put it on. Like that, that is a, they're related problems but different. What I would like to see is a discussion and decision um, in Fedora about the direction that we do. So packet, like, if, if a project is gonna adopt packet building from upstream, then I don't wanna also see work happening in diskit. Like I don't wanna see patches and PRs there and have it be bi-directional, because that's really not, like we should, we should define what the flow looks like from upstream to downstream integration in Fedora. And I think, I think that's important because it gets confusing with some projects. So I, I think it needs to be handled the other way. Like I, I will always say that this kit is the canonical place and you, you are welcome to use any workflow you, you want to put things there. And I think packet is a very, an option that is certainly growing in its usefulness. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, it must take into account the, uh, the proven packager workflow and pull requests from the community and they just must be integrated. Uh, 
into, I mean, like any changes that you do must uh, take into account that things happen in this Git independently. Keep in mind that if you, like let's say we go with the idea of like if you're using packet then you don't have, you don't, people don't do it into disk Git. Mm -hmm. That means for example proven packages are completely cut out. That also means that other community contributors, if they are not accepted members of the upstream project that's using packet, mm -hmm. they can't get changes in. That also means if we do modernizations or infrastructure changes, they can't do anything either. Like it's actually like an extremely painful problem if we block people from being able to work in Diskit. So I'm not advocating blocking, I'm saying that Fedora needs to define what those workflows are. Because right now that's too ambiguous and, and anything can happen and what I see is stuff gets lost. Well, it's actually not that ambiguous. The packaging guidelines pretty clearly say that Diskit is the canonical source for uh, spec files and patches and whatever, but some people think of all these reasons why they don't have to follow that rule or whatever it is. Yeah, that, and, and that kind of goes to communication and marketing and, and making sure everyone understands and is on board with, with what, what that says. Speaking with my packet hat on, uh, like, yeah, the problem is more like, uh, like not, as, 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 uh, as Neil mentioned, like not allowing people who has the right to do something in Fedora this git, not allowing them the, in the upstream. But like when people use packet or other tools and maintain the spec file somewhere else, and this git is just technical way where they put the stuff so Koji has something to build, uh, and if people submit the uh, patches or pull requests there, it may hang there for weeks, slash months, slash years. We don't need Packet uh, to make that for, for us to happen for some uh, so, 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 like, <laughs> it's more about, like, letting people know that the maintainers actually do the stuff somewhere else, and if they want to submit some contribution, they should probably submit it somewhere else, and it may speed up things. Uh, so, so for me, the canonical point of view, like, I, I don't know what is canonical uh, thing in, in this context. So I think that this was a major design problem in Packet. Um, I mean, it was, I know, it, it's, it's, sorry, but things will not work well this way and we'll dig a hole I mean, like, uh, free, we have, what, 8,000 projects, and with 8,000 upstreams, we'll dig 8,000 holes for ourselves to, to fall into. I, I don't know that it's necessarily a hole. I mean, I understand the problem, but, like, We're for example, uh, Anaconda, uh, they, uh, I, I don't know if they use Packet, but they do, they, now. they do releases upstream, and then they maintain the spec file there and just sync it to disk git. But there are occasions where a compose will fail, and Adam will figure out what the problem is, and he'll talk to the Anaconda folks, he'll be like, here's this problem, you know, I'll file a bug, I'll file a pull request, but I'm fixing it in disk git right now and building a new Anaconda so we can have it compose. And that's fine because when the next thing comes along and it overwrites, there's already a pull request because he knows that, you know, in the next version that they release, he wants to have that fix already there. So it, it, I think it's, to your point, it's more of a expectation thing, if you don't know that and you come along and you're like, oh, I'm gonna file a pull request, or the kernel, as Justin will no doubt point out, is the same way. It's, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're filing a, a pull request there or changing something there, that's great, but you should realize <laughs> where you need to make that, the change. That, that's what I'm talking about, is that, that so core issue that's, there. So we, we do actually have, you know, well, so we, we had documentation on the page. When you went to the page, say, you know, with the linked kernel arc saying this is where it's maintained, but we still allowed pull request. Uh, I did actually turn off pull request because they were just being ignored. Uh, but I don't think that getting rid of disk git as much as, I know a lot of people in Red Hat would say source git should be the canonical source. This is where we're working. But I think disk git serves a good purpose there in that I do, yeah, I overwrite disk git. Now I check the diff every time. So if somebody's done something, I'll at least see it. Uh -huh. uh, and hopefully they've, they've put in a merge request and, and the, the source git. But Having disk get there does mean somebody can go fix it without waiting for everything else. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so it do, that does serve that purpose. But you also what we just all said the expectation that you know you're going to fix it there. But I know it's an upstream project that's going to feed back in. So I, I 
I understand how that works and I'm not gonna have that change loss, but right. I, in the interim, I need to fix it now. So and, the yeah. other problem is that we have not defined an expectation of upstream projects that wind up doing this because here's the deal. When you're integrating into Fedora and you're doing this stuff, ultimately the Fedora contributor has to win in a conversation where something needs to be done to fix something. And if that is not happening, if there's no responsiveness in the upstream projects, there's no responsiveness downstream in the Fedora diskit, something has to win, something has to give. And right now, what happens is if somebody has gone to go packety, source kitty, whatever, and, and someone su contrib su submits a change upstream like they're doing it, and no one responds, this is an even worse situation than we have now because there is no agency. We have lost a way to, fi to, to realize a solution because we have deferred our agency to someone else who doesn't have to care about what we're doing. And that is the crux of the problem I have with upstream, uh, upstream packaging. But what you just said is that you described this Git as a last resort. No, I'm saying that if you're following that workflow, you consider Diskit as a last resort. It has to exist as one. Uh, yeah, it has to exist, but, but yeah, it's, uh, I think we are slightly heading to a situation where we have to uh, clear, clearly say what, what is uh, canonical uh, uh, source and differ it from the last resort or, or some, something to do about it. And I, I probably, with, with, uh, with Packet Team, we will probably kick it off in near future. Uh, and we will see where, where we'll uh, head it us. The important thing is that if somebody is going to use upstream project packaging in Fedora and then ship it into Fedora, they also need to understand that there's an expectation that they've got to respond to Fedora needs or otherwise we're going to have to do something. Right, well, I think the point there is that things can change. Yeah. Like say you have a project and you're, you're maintaining it upstream and you're just putting that into Fedora through Diskit and everything's great and rosy and whatever and then maybe somebody takes over the, other, the upstream project but you're still maintaining the downstream thing and they make some change and they're non-responsive. At that point, you may want to break that relationship and you may want to say okay now we're just going to maintain this here here is the canonical source because the upstream is doing things that I don't understand or be not being responsive so I think there needs to be a way to tell people what the canonical source is and it, it can change it could be that it's not the same tomorrow that it was today yeah I think it's a big problem if we're saying that this Git isn't the canonical source anymore. I mean, one, from the agency aspect and for the ability for other people to collaborate on the distribution together, but also for the contributor experience. Like if one package is using GitLab and one package yep. is using oh, Codeberg yeah. and using one email. is using yep. Git that free desktop that whatever. It just creates a very bad experience yep. for contributors and we kind of lose that collaborative aspect and that anyone can go in and leave a review. And I don't think that we should be, you know, trying to communicate to people that the canonical source is somewhere else. I feel very strongly that the canonical source should be dist git. Yeah, so this is, you know, when I look at the contribution experiences between Debian and Fedora, this is the core difference because Debian doesn't have a canonical source requirement, which means that we do, they do not have a singular path to contribution for any package. It could be anyway. Actually, you're not even required to have a VCS for Debian packages. You can just upload things and they will do that. And then you're just gonna have to figure out how, if you need to do something, how, how it's gonna get done. And that's not something I wanna have in Fedora at all. On the other hand, uh, who has more packages, Debian or Fedora? We're per, that does, well, well, how many it, of them are alive? Uh, yeah, because exactly. I, 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 it's, it's, it's the Debian, because uh, I, and, and I think like, yeah, it's make hard thing contributing to other packages, but on the other hand, like this situation make easier other contributors taking care about new packages, because it's more easier for them. So, so, so weighing the problems. I think number of packages is less meaningful than it perhaps used to be because now we have Rust and Go and yeah. a lot of that stuff is just sort of auto-generated. But, you know, yeah. Also, like, you have to think about the quality and the usefulness and the liveliness of those packages. There are a lot of packages in Debian that do not have a functioning 
upstream or development or whatever, they're just carried forward forever. And they don't fail out of the distribution because of things like, oh, they don't compile because they don't, they don't do those kinds of things like we do where we fail out packages for, compi for not compiling uh, year after year, right? Like those are, the, the way we handle our distribution uh, tilts towards active maintenance, which means we will always have less packages than some other distributions that don't have that preference. Yeah, and I personally would rather have more high quality packages than less low quality packages because Fedora is, you know, a collection of high quality packages that has guidelines and standards, not just a kitchen sink of every single possible open source project in existence. So, uh, we are 11 minutes past the initially planned uh, end of life of this session, so <laughs> I think that, uh, I mean, this is a topic we could continue on for, for an hour, another hour, so let's just <laughs> wrap it up now, and uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, thank Thanks you all. Everyone.